Oh my God, Natalia, they are so cute. They are so cute and so smart. I know that people sometimes will initially just think, oh, they're they're cute, they're so adorable, but there's so much more to otters. They're very intelligent. I think that it's good for people to continue to learn about them, to want to know more about them and how can what can they do to help them. Welcome to Animal IQ. In each episode, we rank the intelligence of an animal using our domains of intelligence, ecological, social, rational, awareness, and an X factor. Since animal intelligence is difficult to directly compare, we talk to experts, we read the scientific research, and we bring our own expertise to fill in our rubric. In this episode, we are diving into the intelligence of otters, and I am so excited to see how the puppies of the sea do on our rubric. I have been waiting for us to get to otters for so many episodes. They are one of my favorite animals, and I've always looked at them as fairly smart, but mostly just vessels for cuteness, so I'm pretty pumped to learn more about them. Something we haven't seen much yet on Animal IQ is tool use, and otters use tools. They will take rocks and use them to crack open the shells of clams and snails so they can eat them. This example of tool use is pretty rare and should bump up their ecological score. But it doesn't seem like they're learning this tool use from parents or siblings. It's more that they need to learn to use tools when resources are scarce. Otters are definitely tool users. And here at Shed, I'm sure that if we gave them a tool, they would use it. But we have to be pretty aware that they could also, if we had little shells and things to give them, they could scratch our glass. So instead, they are still finding ways to um, manipulate things, whether it's like if we give them shellfish in a natural habitat, an otter would probably have its rock and help him open the shellfish, whereas our otters will just look to what's around them and what hard surface can they bang it onto. I am really glad that you got to talk to Christy Sterling from Shed. She is super knowledgeable about her otters. It's really interesting that they don't seem to learn this behavior from each other. And that aligns with a couple of other studies that I was reading from 2017, where researchers gave otters puzzles to solve, both a puzzle box and also a rope puzzle, which was similar to the example that we saw in our elephants episode. They had to do this puzzle together and that tells us a lot. We just wanna keep them mentally stimulated. So that can involve different enrichment devices devices, you know, toys, um, or giving them different puzzles to work on. We can put in this whole maze where there's different shelves and we'll put a little feeder ball in it and the sea otter will work its way out. Some were very naturally inclined and just picked up to it and caught to it right away. And some over time have really worked on understanding the concept of it and gaining speed. So otters will live in semi-cooperative groups in the wild, and that made researchers wonder, can otters solve a cooperative task like the rope pulling task, where if two otters pull together, they can get a food reward. But if the otters just pull alone, they won't get the reward. Yeah, I remember reading about this and they didn't do so hot, right? It would seem the otters either didn't have the self-control to wait or they didn't know that they needed a partner to get the treat. So again, not great for social measure, but fascinating nonetheless. And the puzzle boxes that they gave them made this even more personal. Yes, I've used puzzle boxes with lions as well. And they are a great way to ask questions about animals' ability to solve problems, to cooperate to solve problems, and socially learn from each other, like researchers have done with otters. So researchers looked at a group of otters, tried to figure out who might work together, and then they gave these otters a cooperative puzzle to see if they did in fact work together. In one species, the smooth-coated otter, if an individual watched another individual solve the puzzle box, they could then solve it faster, and that does indicate social learning. But in the short clawed otter, they were terrible. They didn't find any evidence for social learning in this species. So it seems like social learning probably is an invaluable skill to all otters, and their social domain score isn't that great. But this really does give credence to their ecological domain. So we know a lot about their social domains, their ecological domains, but there's still more that we should find out. Each otter is different. They're like kids in school and they learn individually. So um, whereas we might have one otter that's like in the game and like picking up and understanding what we're looking for or trying to teach them, we might have to maybe work on a, a certain step longer with another sea otter. Some are a little more confident than others, I would say. So when you're introducing something new, some might be like, sure, no problem. And others might be like, new object, what is this? I need to get used to it. We accommodate for each specific otter, whatever speed they need to learn. Is it just me or do you and Christy have like the best jobs ever? You learn about animals all day, you hang out with them, you listen to lions roar and otters 
Uh, chatter? Do they chatter? Is that what they do? Great question. I've never thought of otters as particularly vocal, but they do use within group and between group communication. So giant otters will call to each other if they're separated from their group and they can recognize the calls of their individual group members. They definitely do vocalize. Um, again, we don't know what their vocalizations mean, but we know that sometimes we will hear them vocalizing when maybe um, one's in one habitat and the other's in another habitat. So possibly they're vocalizing to each other. So researchers use a playback experiment and they would play the call of a familiar group member to a listener otter. And they would just keep playing that call until the listening otter got really sick of hearing it and got bored. Then they'd switch it up and play the call of a new otter. And when the listening otter heard the new otter, it would perk up again. That sounds super annoying, like a scientific version of the Alan, Alan marmot from the memes from a while back. Alan! I love but I guess it does tell us a little bit more about their social interaction. I feel like contact is a lot of the ways that they have communication, whether it's, you know, making contact, touching each other, grooming each other. Um, but they do vocalize, but it's it's not all the time. It's just kind of here and there, and we're not quite sure what it means. So otters are fairly intelligent about some things, but not everything. Like with a lot of our animals, we don't seem to know much about their awareness, which is to me just a more research is needed indicator. But they have a lot of odd behaviors as well, right? They keep us on our toes, that is for sure. They are animals that are very active and um, it's definitely our job to keep them engaged and make their day really fun and stimulating. One thing that I think is great is they juggle rocks and we think that they do it when they're hungry. And another otter in an aquarium in Seattle was trained to use an inhaler to treat its asthma, which I can relate to because I have asthma. And I would love to have an otter bring me my inhaler. And yet another otter in Oregon was trained to dunk a basketball to treat its arthritis. So although otters might not do best on our rubric, they definitely have some skills. Speaking of rubric, a quick reminder, directly comparing intelligence of animals is not something that experts like to do, but our rubric is a way that we can use some of the scientific research to see exactly where we think animals might fall now based on our domains. And here's how those otters measure up. They're amazing at things like tool use and interaction with other otters. They're social, they understand individuality, at least on some level. They can communicate, they can solve problems. They are actually even more remarkable than I thought. Not just cute, but great brains too. Exactly. And as for the X factor, I think we put them right in the middle. We as humans can identify with them who hasn't seen the pictures of the otters holding hands. They seem to care for each other. So they really just seem to enjoy life and be a bit mischievous, which is something we can all aspire to. I agree. Yeah. What do you guys think? Otters, super smart, super amazing, really cute. I think you agree with that last one. Let us know in the comments, what animal do you think we should do next? Let us know that as well. And thank you so much for watching Animal IQ. Well, hello and welcome to our first Friday series of watch parties about all things Belle Isle and the Detroit River, especially as they relate to the larger Great Lakes region. Hello, I am Anna Seisling, producer of Great Lakes Now, an initiative of Detroit Public Television. Always so good to be with you. So that awesome video that we just saw was actually called Animal IQ, in case you didn't catch that. That came to us courtesy of PBS Digital Studios and PBS Nature. You can learn more about the Animal IQ series series by visiting PBS Terra YouTube channel. We'll be sure to drop that link into the chat for you. All right. So it should come as no surprise at this point that we are talking about otters for this first Friday watch party. And we have a really great lineup of guests for this watch party. But first, I'd like to welcome our co-host for this particular watch party. That is WDET, Detroit's NPR station, the Michigan Learning Channel, the Michigan DNR Outdoor Adventure Center, and Independent Environmental Newsletter. 
Letter Planet Detroit. We also have a, a whole slurry of co-hosts joining for this month's watch party. So we have WTTW 11 as Chicago's PBS, uh, Detroit Public Television, of course, PBS Michiana, WNIT in South Bend, Indiana, uh, WDET, the Belle Isle Conservancy, Belle Isle Nature Center, Planet Detroit, ISD Experimental Lakes Area, Tara at Detroit Public Television, WPBS TV in Watertown, New York, WQLN in Erie, Pennsylvania, WNMU TV, PBS in Marquette, Michigan, PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio, Milwaukee PBS, Circle of Blue, the Michigan Learning Channel, and as I said, the Michigan DNR Outdoor Adventure Center. All right, so as I said just a moment ago, we are talking about otters. We're talking about sea otters, river otters, all kinds of otters, and how we in the Great Lakes region can be supportive to their survival and the habitats that they rely on here. They are an indicator species. We'll learn a little bit more about that term later on in the watch party. But essentially what that means is that their presence or absence can tell us a whole lot about the health of various Great Lakes waterways. And to everybody watching on Facebook and YouTube Live, feel free to chat with us as we go. Drop a note, let me know where you're watching from. Or of course, if you have any comments or questions about sea otters, river otters, you can drop those into the comments and I'll be sure to work those in as we go. We do have a, a couple people chiming in already. We have John from Jefferson Chalmers Riverfront Parks. Love to have John tuned in this afternoon. And we have Kay Clark, who is tuning in from Northeast Ohio. And then Kenyon uh, wants to know who here believes that the otter is their spirit animal. And then we have uh, somebody, Precious Ryder, uh, very northern border of Detroit, tuning in. And Nicole Brown, who is tuned in from San Antonio, Texas. All right, so keep those comments coming for me. And like I said, I'll be sure to work those in as we go. So now I'm really excited to welcome our guests for today's watch party. First up, we have Dr. John Hardig. Dr. John Hardig is an award-winning Great Lakes scientist and columnist for Great Lakes Now. Hardig actually recently penned a special column for Great Lakes Now on the significance of the recent otter sighting on the Detroit River. John, so great to have you with us today. Hi, Anna. Great to be with everyone. And then we have Natalie Reamer, who is curator of terrestrial animals at the Great Lakes Aquarium in Duluth, Minnesota. She is the caretaker of two otters who live at the aquarium. Hi, Natalie. Great to have you. Thank you. So excited to be here. We're excited to have you. So we're actually going to start with you. And, you know, as we just saw in that video, um, there's a whole lot. They're not just cute. Otters are really intelligent. And that uh, one specifically, that video, you know, was a little bit more about sea otters. But I imagine there's probably some crossover. So let's start, though, maybe first with the differences. Talk a little bit about what the biggest differences are between sea otters and the river otters that we know and love here in the Great Lakes. Absolutely. So uh, actually, there are 13 different species of otters. And like you had mentioned in the video, it focuses a lot on sea otters. Um, but here in the United States, we have sea otters and North American river otters. And I am lucky enough to be able to work with two North American river otters here at Great Lakes Aquarium up in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, but also, like you had touched on, there are a lot of differences with these otters. Um, a lot of people don't know that uh, sea otters are quite a bit bigger than North American river otters. They can get 60 to 80 pounds. Wow. Um, and usually North American river otters max out at about 25 pounds, you know, for a large male. Um, our girls weigh around 17 pounds here. Um, so that's one of the really main differences between sea otters and river otters. Um, also, a lot of people don't realize um, that when you think of otters and you think of them floating on their backs and using tools, that's usually a sea otter. Mm -hmm. North American river otters don't normally tend to float on their backs like that. They don't normally tend to use types of tools to eat their diets. So that's one of the main differences as well um, between the North American river otter and the sea otters. Okay. Um, and then also the habitat that you find them in. So sea otters are only found in the oceans um, and North American river otters are mostly found in freshwater. They also have a little bit of overlap with sea, uh, sea water as well, um, but usually freshwater with the North American river otters. So I would say that those are some of the really big differences between the two. 
Okay, cool. And as we continue to chat, I want to make sure that we drop a link to the Great Lakes Aquarium into the chat for anybody who's interested. Uh, maybe you live in Duluth or you're thinking about taking a little road trip out there this summer. I want to make sure that we put that link in the chat. So um, let's check out this little video uh, that we have of the river otters that you actually care for at the Great Lakes Aquarium. Awesome. So yeah, as you can see here, they're really playful. Uh, we have two sisters that live here. They just turned nine. Their names are Agate and Orr. Um, I am so lucky to be able to work with them on a daily basis. Uh, they are very charismatic animals. Um, and right now we're actually doing some new training with them. Uh, it's called free contact training. So I get to actually go in with them and do a lot of different A to B targeting where I actually ask them to go to a target on the outside of the exhibit um, and then come back to me. And that just gives us a really good opportunity uh, to move the otters around in their space, to get a good look at them, uh, to let them basically um, participate in their own health care, getting that close up look with them. So yeah, it's been super great. That's really cool. And, you know, I'm kind of thinking about the through line of that video we just saw talking about the intelligence of the sea otter. It sounds like doing this kind of enrichment and stimulation for the river otters in your care, um, they're, they seem pretty intelligent too. Absolutely. Yep. So it's super fun to come up with new things for them to think about and figure out different puzzles. Um, enrichment is something that is really important, especially under human care, to keep their minds healthy and active, keep them um, interested in their space that they are in every day. Um, so just coming up with new things for them to try. One, one thing that I really like to give them is um, pieces of PVC pipe that are open at one end but closed at the other end, and then we can put food in there. Um, the PVC sinks to the bottom, so then they actually have to figure out how to get that food out of just the one open end instead of, you know, the closed end. Um, so that's really cool to watch them manipulate those different tools and those different toys. Um, so that's a pretty common enrichment item that we use. We also love giving them heads of lettuce. Uh, they love shredding that as well. Um, and even live minnows. That's super fun to watch them hunt and be able to swim that fast. Wow. Okay, cool. Um, I'm also really excited. We have some comments and questions coming in from folks. So Diane Summers Yelton is tuning in from Milwaukee. Hi, Diane. Welcome. So happy to have you tuning in today. And then we also have Elizabeth Hardig who says they are so cute. Um, and we also have a question coming in from Eric Wanta. I wonder if you'll be able to answer this one for us, Natalie. So Eric wants to know, is there a relationship between river otters and beavers? Do they hang out? Do they avoid each other? Any idea about that relationship? So beavers and North American river otters tend to share the same waterways uh, mm -hmm. just because usually they're found in healthy ecosystems, both of them, um, but they do have a very different diet. So I would say that they are in a very similar niche in their environments, but they don't necessarily um, interact with each other. Uh, mm -hmm. Beavers are more uh, herbivores where they're going to, you know, look for that vegetation in the water, whereas North American river otters are more um, carnivorous. So they're not really sharing the same diets or anything like that, but they can be found in the same habitats for sure. So, okay. yeah. Cool. Um, and then somebody who um, is anonymous on YouTube, uh, we are, I think I can probably answer this one because we talked a little bit about this before. Speaking of big, which ones grow larger, fresh or seawater? As we were saying before, this the sea otters are, are much larger, right? Yep, absolutely. Yep. Cool. And then we have another comment coming in from Sandy Putney, who says, we love watching our local river otters with the snow slides they make. Our farm is on the mighty St. Lawrence River. Plus, we have a creek that feeds into the St. Lawrence. Sandy, you are a lucky, lucky person to have that opportunity. And um, Natalie, as I was kind of looking and doing a little bit of research, looking for different video assets and things, I did notice that it seems like the otters really love to play in the snow. Is that an enrichment opportunity that you give the otters at the Great Lakes aquarium? It sure is. We are actually a fully indoor facility, but when we get some really crazy snowfall up here, we love to gather as many staff members as we can and collect as much snow as possible from outside. So we bring out 
uh, buckets and coolers and tubs and we shovel in all of that snow to their exhibit and it is a sight to see when they <laughs> hit that snow it's so slippery and they just love playing in it it pretty much initiates sister wrestling right away so oh my gosh it's super I fun to watch <laughs> so okay i know that you obviously care for the river otters at the aquarium but there are also some other animals in your care um as you kind of oversee the whole terrestrial um side of the the animals that are there so let's check out some photos and have you talk us through um some of the other animals so so who are these guys yeah, absolutely. So um, we on site as well, we have some American alligators. So right here, this is Salem, Binks and Casper. Um, they've been with us for about two years here at the aquarium. So they are really, really cool animals as well. They're ambassadors to their wild counterparts. So we usually bring them out for um, different camps and classes. Uh, so that's been really fun working with them. Like you had mentioned, I work with pretty much everything at the aquarium that's not a fish. Hmm. So as you can see here, um, this is a bald eagle that I work with. His name is Bogey. Um, he actually just turned 23 this year. Wow. Um, so working with him is super cool as well. Getting to share his story. All of our birds here at the aquarium are considered non-releasable wildlife. So that means they have a permanent injury or illness that prevents them from being returned back to the wild. So Bogey here fell out of his nest as a young chick and cannot fly very well. He also has, has some nerve damage. So he gets to live out the rest of his life here being an ambassador. So working with him is, you know, great. Um, and then here we have Snoops. He is a striped skunk. Um, you can see that he is harness trained. So he comes out and, you know, tries to break that negative connotation that skunks have about, you know, being these pests when really, you know, they are great insect control for our our yards at home. Um, they eat all of the things that we don't want in our yards. Um, so having him here as an ambassador has been great as well, spreading his story. Um, and then we also have some other, here's a turkey vulture. His name is Horace. Um, like I said, he's also non-releasable, but getting to speak to larger groups about him and how great turkey vultures are, cleaning up our roadways um, with the roadkill out there. So they're super important to our environment and something that we see, you know, on a daily basis a lot of the time. So sharing his story. And then here we have Walter, who is a an endangered wood turtle. Um, so just sharing his story as well and how we can better our ecosystems and help these endangered or threatened species um, just gives us that great opportunity to make that connection with guests here at the aquarium. Got it. All right. Natalie Reamer, Curator of Terrestrial Animals at the Great Lakes Aquarium in Duluth, Minnesota, who is the lucky caretaker of two river otters who call that aquarium home. Natalie, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Let's have you hang on just in case any other questions about otters come in. But um, now I'd love to talk with Dr. John Hardig. So uh, Dr. John Hardig, as I said in the beginning of the watch party, is an award-winning Great Lakes scientist and a columnist with Great Lakes now. In fact, he is the person who wrote the story that kind of went locally viral about the Detroit uh, about the Detroit River sighting of a river otter. So we'll be sure to drop that article into the chat for folks who are interested in, in looking at that. Um, John, so I want to talk with you uh, a little bit. You've spent your entire career kind of working on the cleanup and restoration of the Great Lakes, speci uh, specifically these areas of concern. So talk a little bit how about how the cleanup effort um, has led to the ecological revival of these areas, specifically the Detroit River, where of course we saw that river otter. Yes, uh, through the first starting with the International Joint Commission, which is set up by treaty between Canada and the United States, we've been working on the cleanup of these most polluted areas of the Great Lakes, the areas of concern as they're called. And it's been a multi-decade process, but we had to first, you know, control pollution from municipal wastewater treatment plants and industries. Then we had to start restoring habitats and we had to prevent pollution. But the rivers are improving. And in our backyard, the Detroit River is one of the most remarkable cleanup 
projects that you will find because it was so polluted. You know, we were the industrial heartland. We were the arsenal of democracy. We had a lot of pollution. Um, and now we are seeing dramatic improvements in the water quality that have led to some surprising ecological revival. Mm -hmm. I love that. Uh, I also want to make sure that I'm continuing to invite uh, engagement from our live audience. So if you are tuning in today, let us know where you're watching from. And of course, if you have any questions or comments about river otters, you can drop those into the chat and I will be uh, sure to work those into the conversation as we go. We have Alex Hardig and Valerie Barkley watching from Cambridge, Ontario. And then we have a question about uh, whether or not there are otters in Lake Superior. John, I wonder if that's one you should answer or if we should turn that over to Natalie. Do you have any she's, idea? She's from uh, Lake Superior. Let's let her answer that one. All right, Natalie. So otters in Lake Superior. Yes, um, definitely along Lake Superior. Lake Superior is very, very cold. Um, but yes, you can see them along the shores for sure. Lake Superior is the largest lake. Um, so definitely not in the middle of the lake, uh, but along the shores, definitely. Got it. All right. Thank you for that. So, John, back to you now. So the background of this story that kind of, as I said, went went kind of viral locally in the Great Lakes region uh, about this river otter spotted in the Detroit River. Give us a little bit of the flavor and the background of that story. How did it uh, how did it get on your radar? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, what a thrill. I'm on the uh, faculty of the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research at University of Windsor. One of their PhD students was going out for a walk one morning before a long day in the laboratory and wanted to just be outside and clear his head. And he saw a head pop out of the water. Hmm. And he says, hmm, that's interesting. It looks a little bit big to be a, you know, a muskrat or even a mink. And then he saw it dive underwater and saw the otter tail. And he, and he saw that it wasn't the flat beaver tail. Mm. So he ran out onto a, um, a bridge that, I mean, a, you know, a, a walkway that went out underneath the ambassador bridge, got out his phone and started taking pictures and a video. And it was a river otter the first time in a hundred years that we've seen them in the Detroit River. Oh my God, just amazing. So talk a little bit, you know, when we were chatting the other day during the rehearsal for this watch party, you were telling me that river otters were actually introduced intentionally into this area. So I'm curious, talk a little bit more about, um, about the introduction of this species to this region's waterways and um, kind of, you know, what, what seeing a river otter here in the Detroit River, what it says kind of about the overall health and resilience of that particular waterway. So river otters were first uh, uh, extirpated, so locally extinct in our backyard because of the fur trade. Mm -hmm. But then during the, the height of pollution, you know, think of World War II and the arsenal of democracy, there was so much oil that uh, river otters and beavers could not have survived because the oil would coat their fur. They couldn't thermoregulate, they couldn't keep warm and they would die. So as we started to clean up uh, these waterways, um, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources picked out a couple of very clean streams in Eastern Ohio, down near uh, Pennsylvania to reintroduce otters there. And they thrived. And of course, otters are very adventurous. They started moving out. They went over to Cleveland to the Cuyahoga Valley National mm -hmm. Park and thrived there. In the early 2000s, they kept coming west and they made it to Cedar Point. And then they made it to Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, a few miles east of Toledo, Ohio. Then in 2019, they were discovered first by an otter slide in the snow in Point Pelee National Park on the other side of the lake, the north side of Lake Erie uh, in, in Canada. And so they they confirmed the otters present there. And then we, our antennae went up immediately and said, oh, my goodness, they could be coming to us next. And we've been watching them. There have been a few anecdotal reports, but nothing confirmed until this PhD student named Eric St. Marie founded on his wonderful morning walk just a month ago. 
Oh my gosh, I love that. I bet that's a walk that Eric is going to remember forever. Uh, we have a comment coming in from Diver Solo on YouTube who says, here in Ohio, ODNR introduced river otters in the Grand River in Northeast Ohio many years ago, but they did not survive. So as you were saying, John, I mean, th these are uh, kind of indicator species. So they tend to go where where they where they'll be able to survive and, and potentially thrive, right? They kind of follow right. the clean water. They're indicators of clean waters, of healthy mm -hmm. waters. They're an indicator of ecosystem health. And, and so what a great story for us that the Detroit River has improved enough that otters could come back. Um, but we are not done. We still have um, more work to do in controlling urban stormwater runoff. And we've got to adapt and mitigate climate change. And we have contaminated sediments. But this is hope. And this is saying that our pollution prevention and our pollution control programs are working and gives us more momentum to keep going to care for the places we all call home. Absolutely. And, you know, on that note, as we kind of start to wind things down here, a couple more things I wanted to ask you about. And the first one is, um, can you talk at all about other species that you are looking out for that kind of uh, might potentially be able to demonstrate the river's resilience here? Yeah, we've, uh, Detroit River has had a, an amazing uh, um, cadence of things coming back, like bald eagles, peregrine falcons, osprey, lake sturgeon, lake whitefish, beaver, otter. You know, we on our radar screen, you know, one of the most threatened uh, species is uh, freshwater mussels. Mm -hmm. And we're keeping an eye out on the freshwater mussels. And so there's some other species that we want to track as well. But uh, uh, there are programs in place both among governments and universities and research institutes to track this over time. Got it. And, you know, I'm also curious, we're always thinking about engagement and ways that people who tune into these videos and people in general living in the Great Lakes region can be better stewards to this ecosystem. So what can people do to get involved in these restoration efforts throughout the Great Lakes, particularly uh, in, you know, along the Detroit River, if you're familiar with any efforts or organizations that uh, folks can get involved with? Well, Eric St. Marie showed us just how valuable citizen science is, being aware of where you are, keeping your eyes open and having your camera ready. What a thrill for him to find the first otter in a hundred years. But we have some great organizations like Friends of the Detroit River that do cleanups on the Detroit River, Friends of the Rouge that monitor the invertebrates and fish in the Rouge River, Detroit Audubon that does Christmas bird counts and restores uh, habitat for birds. We have the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge that has uh, volunteer stewardship crews to remove invasive species. And of course, we have the Detroit River Hawk Watch where people can get involved in monitoring uh, raptors crossing the river each fall. It's amazing opportunities. We need citizens to get involved and to help learn and have fun with make friends along the way, but contribute to science, contribute to our understanding and better management of these ecosystems. Absolutely. And last question for you coming to us from Planet Detroit. Um, and the question is, what should people do if they do see an otter? They should reach out to, uh, you could reach out to me, you could reach out to Great Lakes now. Keep us informed if you see one. We would love to know about that and track it. We've had a few reports. Some of them have been, you know, muskrat, but we would love to learn more. And that is the value and benefit of centers in science. We can't have a science in every, you know, small piece of land and water on the Detroit River and its tributaries, but citizens can keep an eye out and keep watch for us. So please reach out to us. Absolutely. All right. Well, it is about that time to wrap up another edition of the First Friday Great Lakes Now series of our Facebook Live watch parties. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, a big thank you to our guests today. We have Dr. John Hardig here, an award-winning Great Lakes scientist and columnist for Great Lakes Now. Dr. John Hardig, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And then, of course, we also have Natalie Reamer, who is the curator of terrestrial animals at the Great Lakes Aquarium in Duluth, Minnesota. She is the lucky caretaker of two river otters who call that aquarium home. Natalie, it was so great to have your expertise uh, on hand for today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.
And a big thank you to everyone over at WDET, Detroit's NPR, Planet Detroit, the Michigan Learning Channel, and the Michigan DNR Outdoor Adventure Center, along with our other co-hosts for today. We'll pull up that map again, just so I can thank all of those wonderful co-hosts. So we have uh, PBS Michiana, WNIT in South Bend, Indiana, WTTW11, Chicago's PBS. We have uh, ISD, Experimental Lakes Area, Tara at Detroit Public Television, WPBS-TV in Watertown, New York, WQLN, Erie, Pennsylvania, WNMU-TV, PBS in Marquette, Michigan, PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio, Milwaukee, PBS, and Circle of Blue, Michigan Learning Channel, and as I said, the Michigan DNR Outdoor Adventure Center. I'd also really like to extend thanks to uh, Tammy Winsell, Sandra Svoboda, Colleen O'Donnell, Mila Murray, Natasha Blakely, Lana Cantardi, and all of the other folks over at Detroit Public Television who helped to make this watch party possible each month. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back next month. And until then, we'll see you out on the lakes.